welcome to the Peace Talk, um, this time uh, with Professor Roy Casagranda from Texas and Moritz Zimmermann from Austria. I'm very glad, glad that, that you both found the, the time to talk to, to the Vienna Peace, Peace Institute. Institute. I hope uh, we will have an interesting conversation. Okay. Welcome, Professor Casagranda. It's really an honor to have you here on this talk and um, I'm surprised that you found time even. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to, to, to the two of us, lowly political science students from uh, across the globe. Professor Casagrande, if you, if you allow, I'll uh, introduce you to the viewers just very quickly and very briefly. You are a professor of government at the Austin Community College at the moment, and you're also the founder and president of the Austin School, which is a student club and a lecture series with a YouTube channel. You've had a couple of very interesting guest speakers, including Mr. Pickering, um, former uh, U.S. ambassador, which I saw that there was a talk very interesting on the Iran deal. Um, you have a PhD in Germanic studies, is that correct, from the University of, Aust of Texas at Austin? Yes. My first very quick and very brief question is, what's your undergrad? Because I, I couldn't find that. Oh, it's political science. Your undergrad is in political science, and then... I also have a master's degree in political science. Okay, and then, but you did your PhD in Germany? No, I... Partly, or... No, I did my PhD entirely in Texas. Entirely, uh, okay. No, they, really what Germanic Studies did was they hosted an ad hoc interdisciplinary PhD. And so what right. it was, it was a mixture of uh, political science, philosophy, uh, Germanic Studies, economic psychology. So it was, a, it was a really a strange PhD. Wow, but it, it sounds very interesting. Was it also a lot of German philosophical thought? Or? So, Yes, I mean, it, it very heavily focused on Heidegger, Habermas, oh, uh, Marcuse, right. and... Oh, so indeed Frankfurt School as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. That's actually one of the things that I want to talk about later is the, the kind of schism that exists between what's regarded as critical theory in the United States, right, on Columbia University especially, and Kritische Theorie in, in German, which is a literal translation, but the political currents couldn't be like farther away from each other, I think. But okay, let's get to that later. Um, you've lived in Germany and in Egypt, as well as in Lebanon, Algeria, and England as well. That brings me to my first question. Um, professor, what's your personal interest in the Middle East, and how did you get to, to spend so much time there and, and, and learn Arabic? So, uh... I am actually half Egyptian. Um, my mother is Egyptian. My father is uh, a, a mixture of Central Europeans. It's Swedish, German, and Italian. Um, and my father was in the oil industry. And so we spent a lot of my early childhood traveling. And then my mother ended up working as a civilian nurse for the United States Army, which then brought me traveling again. And uh, I've always maintained a really strong connection to Egypt. So I, I try to go periodically and spend a few months every few years. Um, I'm obsessed with the Middle East, I think, in large part because it, it seems to me that the United States has become obsessed with the Middle East and in a really violent way. And so I feel like it's my duty, um, not just because of my own personal background, but it's my duty as a citizen of an empire to push back against that. Okay, so in this tradition you're almost like uh, an Egyptian version of Noam Chomsky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it not as well known or published or successful? <laughs> okay, but well, I mean, Noam Chomsky is probably one of the most prolific intellectuals of our time, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, and my, my second question would be very concrete um, and a, a very topical issue. The current administration under President Trump is going to have to decide on a future of the Iran deal next week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what's your position on the Iran deal as a whole, and what do you think about its future? Is the U.S. going to renew the commitment, or is it going to actually withdraw unilaterally from the deal? And what are going to be the consequences if that happens, in your opinion? So, this is obviously something I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, and in, in fact you mentioned that we brought in Ambassador Pickering last semester, so we've been trying to maintain a little bit of a dialogue about this, uh, the Austin School has, and you know, uh, 
it's it's really a strange situation because the argument that Netanyahu and Trump have been making is that that Iran will be able to get the nuke in after ten years, which we are we're already three years into the deal, so it'd be in seven years. So that's actually not quite accurate. So it is true that uh, in seven years provisions of the deal will start to go away, and at that point, if Iran wanted to. They could begin working on the nuke, but it's very unlikely that they would be able to finish the project until all the provisions went away of the deal, and that would be in about 12 years. So if Iran decided to start working on the nuke in seven years, it would probably take them five years to break out. Um, now, one of the weird intel things that you kept hearing before the Iran nuclear deal was that Iran was days from getting the nuke, months from getting the nuke, years from getting the nuke. But you know, we kept hearing this every year for a decade. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm dubious as to how accurate the intel is, but you know, the general consensus was Iran was somewhere between six months to a year from getting the nuke. So by doing the nuclear deal, we've postponed Iran for 15 years. So this idea that uh, we should end the deal because it doesn't prevent Iran from ever getting the nuke is, is really strange. It's, it's equivalent to saying, I smoke because I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> Play Russian roulette because I'm going to die anyway. It, it, it makes no sense. And I, I've been thinking about, you know, what's the best possible thing, or what's the worst possible thing Iran gets a nuke in 15 years. That's 15 years that we didn't have to deal with the nuclear Iran. Um, that's that's 15 years that we bought humanity. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that really what all a peace activist is doing, is trying to postpone wars? Because as long as we have states and as long as we have capitalism and as long as we have unequal distribution of wealth in the world, uh, states have every incentive to, to conduct wars against each other when they have the ability to. Um, so, you know, there's there's sort of a strange double think going on, I think, in the community that doesn't want this Iran nuclear deal to happen. Trump has said, Trump has had to uh, confirm the deal twice now. And, you know, this will be his third time. He's supposed to do it every six months. And both times he said he was going to end the deal. And then, of course, he ended up saying, no, we're going to keep it going. Um, according to the UN, according to the EU, and according to the, the White House, according to the United States, Iran is in compliance with the deal. So if he yeah. breaks the deal, he will be breaking it despite the fact that Iran has done nothing to warrant the deal being broken. Um, now the European Union has stated that, they, that the European Union will stick to the deal terms if Iran does, even if the United States breaks it. Um, right. And Iran and is their friends as well, right? Right. Uh, and, and, and Iran has said both, that they will keep the deal going, that they don't need the United States to be a part of it, and Iran has also said they will definitely break it if the United States leaves. So, you know, what Iran does is completely unclear. We, we really don't know. What I think is really interesting is that Trump has said he's going to have, he's going to talk to Korea by the end of this month, North Korea. And he sort of indicated that it'll be somewhere on the 21st, between the 21st and 28th, to make a deal. Well, it's impossible for me to believe that you could meet with North Korea for two days and walk away with a peace deal. But even if all they did was renegotiate the past peace deals and just re-sign them, why would North Korea ever agree to make a nuclear disarmament yeah. deal with the United States with, with us? unilaterally breaking mm. the deal that we have with Iran. Yeah. So from a from a diplomatic standpoint, this is a nightmare. It's a it's a catastrophe. I can't for the life of me figure out why you would break a deal like this, other than you're gunning for a war. Like I mean I think that's clearly what Israel wants, right? Israel wants us to break the deal so that Iran decides to go ahead and make the nuke and then that triggers a war with them. Um, but then of course if that asks the question why? It, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you, actually, Professor, because it seems uh, as though Netanyahu and his cabinet especially are so hell-bent on demonizing Iran and really even going as far as lying in front of the whole world with this press conference 
where he went out and almost construed or at least mis presented misleading facts about uh, uh, alleged um, breakings of, of the of the of the deal unilaterally by Iran. What do you what do you make of this obsession? Do you really think that they're aiming for a war? Because what I mean, could that really be something that anyone wants? I mean, it does certainly look like it. Not just the recent developments in uh, Israel's and the United States foreign policy, but the last couple of years have kind of pointed in this direction. But I still think it's really hard to believe that anyone would would actually go ahead and, and risk that with the president of the uh, disastrous Iraq and Afghanistan wars. It, it is really hard to understand. Uh, like I, I, I try, I've been trying to wrap my mind around this for a while. I, I believe it was 2006, Israel asked the United States permission to fly over Iraq to do a military strike against Iran, and the Bush administration categorically said no. So, so at least for 12 years, Israel has been seriously contemplating military action against Iran. Um, and then, of course, just this year, Israel attacked Iranian positions inside Syria. Uh, so it, it feels like you know there there has actually been an escalation, and of course Israel and the United States and Saudi Arabia are in a proxy war against Iran in Yemen, even though the United States and Saudi Arabia are more or less allied with Iran in Syria, at least against where it goes against ISIL, right? Uh, clearly, Syria is backing the Syrian government, but in, at least in the fight against ISIL, we were on the same side. So it, it's really quite chaotic from, you know, like on the ground. The, the the speech that Netanyahu gave, which looked like a TED talk, and so everybody keeps referring to, to it as the TED talk, was remarkable because there wasn't anything necessarily factually wrong with it. It's just that all the stuff he was talking about took place between 2003 and 2015. Well, that's, and it ends at the point where the Iran nuclear deal goes into effect. So really, if you think about it, it's an argument for why we need the Iran nuclear deal. <laughs> you know, like, it's like saying, oh my God, you're, you've been in rehab now for three years, but I found out you were, you were using drugs for 12 years. And then you have to point out, yeah, that's why I'm in rehab <laughs> now. I'm in rehab, exactly. And so, it's, it's interesting that the IEA came around, I think the next day and said, well, we are aware of all these documents. They're pretty old. Uh, and we don't see why that that should you know be considered as, as as kind of a breach of contract, right? Right. I mean, it's actually the reason why we have the Iran nuclear deal. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think it also underlines the tension between the IEA um, as a UN body that's kind of looking for disarmament and for like uh, nuclear yeah nuclear disarmament. Um, and the United States and Israel, I'm sure you remember the scandal when they um, actually, uh, they were caught, um, what's the word, spying on um, uh, Director General Mohammed al Yeah. in the, the, the early 2000s. I mean, they were actually spying on the Director General of the IAEA and kind of were trying to, to push him away, to get him to resign from his post because they were afraid that he was going to be, follow a politics of appeasement with Iran and of actual disarmament. So right. the diplomatic and, and I, I would say intelligence efforts to, to really move towards a war, they seem very obvious. And but <laughs> never, nevertheless, very, it's hard to, to, to understand, as you said before. So there is also another phenomenon going on and it's, it seems like it's an ideological phenomenon. So uh, when I talk to conservatives in the United States, I, will, I have frequently heard, especially uh, strongly conservative, so not moderately conservative, I have frequently heard people say something in effect of, I'm more afraid of Iran than I am of ISIL. Um, you know, that when it comes to threats in the world, Iran is a much bigger threat to the United States. Um, than other states, which is really remarkable because, you know, like I don't, Iran doesn't appear to be on the brink of doing anything to the United States. So uh, it makes you wonder sort of where that's coming from. 
And the reason I'm bringing this up is because Pompeo and Walton both fit very neatly into yeah. that category. And of course, uh, Pompeo is our new Secretary of State and Walton is our new National Security Advisor. And so we're in this really weird situation where there are these really powerful anti-Iran hawks in the Trump administration. So it's not just Trump, it's not just Netanyahu, it's now also direct members of the administration who are counseling this direction. Which makes me think maybe we will, in fact, this time on May 12th, you know, unilaterally uh, break this treaty. Um, it's had a pretty interesting effect on Iran directly. Uh, you know, Iran has just declared that you can no longer send dollars out of the country. Um, and it's because the Iranian economy is in, it's in shambles. Because, you know, everybody had expected the deal would go into effect. All these European businesses would start doing work in Iran. And, and that did actually start to happen. Uh, and then Trump got elected and everything sort of fell backwards. Mm -hmm. Because people lost confidence in the possibility that this deal will last. So it, 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 it does have a very powerful ideological component. Um, again, I can't comprehend the idea of a war with Iran. Iran is much bigger than Iraq and Afghanistan combined, both in land and in population. And then, of course, Iran is a, is a very industrialized state, where Afghanistan was terribly unindustrialized, and we blew up Iraq's industry. So, you know, like a, a war with Iran feels like it would be a much more real event. Um, and we didn't succeed in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, you know, like from a logical standpoint, it just seems beyond insane. <laughs> um, can, I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, please. Um, the whole de debate is, is like um, very interesting for me. I don't have the, the knowledge, but um, in my perspective, it, it shows the double thing of the Western countries because, um, like like we mentioned, Israel and the interests in, uh, of Israel and uh, Netanyahu and so on. Um, I mean, didn't the Western world help actually uh, Israel getting the nuke and? Israel get the nuke very silently, very secretly, and I mean, isn't isn't that showing that here is a you know double double standard? Very much so. So so how how do you see this thing? So I, I mean I mean me personally and the 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 idea of the whole Vana Peace Institute is of course that every. Every country should uh, disarm. Uh, so, with one word, disarmament is our our goal. So, we try, of course, to advocate um, that this is this is the main focus. But you know, as you see, in 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 the Ukraine, for example, the Ukraine did um, give up their nukes, and what happened? You know, yeah. I mean, maybe you cannot. Um, uh, compare these these both countries, but I mean Russian, the Russian intervention wouldn't happen maybe if 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 the Ukraine get, had stayed with with the old system, you know. So, so uh, you bring up a great point, which is if you're Iranian, you would probably want to get the nuke. So even if you even if your general default setting is let's not have nukes. If we have nukes, eventually we're going to use them, right? Because I think I think that's also true. Um, the lesson that you would learn from the Ukraine and the lesson that you would learn from Iraq is that if you don't have the nuke, a superpower at some point is probably going to go after you. Um, you know, the axis of evil was North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. North Korea was actively working on the nuke. Iraq wasn't. Uh, Iraq ended up being the one that got destroyed. Ukraine gave up its nukes. The Russians invade. I mean, I think there's a there's a pretty pretty <coughs> to learn here. Get the nuke. Okay. Well, uh, I, I I I personally think with and I don't uh, claim to be anywhere near as knowledgeable as you on this topic. So please just take this as a lowly, uninformed opinion of a of a mere student. But um, I think the situation in in the Ukraine is somewhat different because the annexation of the Crimea, which we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But also it, Donetsk and the whole yeah, the, part of Ukraine has, has basically been overrun. Odessa. But there, there's the, the conflict there is still going on and it, 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 
you can you couldn't claim that there that Russia has already annexed it and, and made it part of, of uh, the Russian Federation as of just yet. But the Crimea wasn't it also you know majoritarian R Russian ethnicity and, and Russian speakers? I'm not actually even worried about whether or not the Russians are in the right or the wrong. For for me, the issue is if the Ukraine had the nuke, this probably would not have happened. Yeah, this this was this was the tragic. This was my 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 point. This is a tragic uh, logic, but um, I think it 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 is true. Uh, I, I see this with the same argument. I mean, with this from with the, from the issue of the nuclear uh, weapon, because I think the response if Russia had annexed a completely Ukrainian part of Ukraine, um, the international response with or without nukes uh, would have been much much more. Uh, strong, but <clears throat> I, I want to. Um, I don't believe that. that's true. <laughs> no? I, I, I think the I think that the world would be be okay if Russia outright annexed Ukraine. I think the idea of doing World War Three against Russia, it's going to have to be something really pressing, right? Uh, world War Three against Russia, Russia just looks like a, a, a nightmare. I, I can't even comprehend the scenario where we would care about the Ukraine. <laughs> Yeah, but short of World War III happening, there could have also been other measures, like even further sanctioning the country and so on. But okay, yes, I, I accept your your your. your so point. let's go back to the Israel question because yeah, this... I wanted to actually ask one more question okay, about sure. that. Sorry, uh, if I can play the advocatus diaboli here, um, when comparing Israel with nuclear weapons versus Iran potentially with nuclear weapons. Couldn't you see how Israelis would be more fearful of Israel, uh, Iran obtaining nuclear weapons since Iran's official state policy, which is, has reiterated again and again, has been to wipe Israel off the face of the earth? And even if you could say that it's just rhetoric and that uh, you know the Iranian public um, has no such interest, still it's kind of scary to even conceive of the possibility of such a Thing happening just because a religious leadership um, sees it as their religious and moral duty to do so. Okay, so from what I can tell of the Iranian religious leadership, and obviously I can't read minds, um, they're probably smart enough to know that if they were to nuke Israel, that they would then receive a retaliatory strike, not not just from Israel, which also has nukes, um, but also almost certainly from the United States as well. So it would be an act of suicide. Um, I, I, I could be wrong about this, but I suspect that the majority of the leadership at the top in the Islamic Republic of Iran are, are actually cynical and just manipulate stuff for their own purposes. So I, can't, I actually cannot imagine a scenario where Iran would preemptively use the nuke on Israel. I think the reason why Israel doesn't want Iran to get the nuke, and, and it'd be the same reason why Israel wouldn't want Egypt to get the nuke, is because they, they fear that they would lose their, their, their ability to bully their neighbors. So if, if Egypt were to go to war with Israel again in the, in the future, the Egyptian military is so much superior to the Israeli military at this point, there's no way Israel could prevail. So the fact that Israel has the nuke and Egypt doesn't have the nuke works really well for Israel because it makes it so that a, a future war between Egypt and Israel just doesn't make sense. Right? The Egyptians can't win, so there's no reason on earth for the Egyptians to ever do it. If Iran had the nuke and Israel nuked Egypt in a war, Iran could then claim, well, we're just doing this as vengeance for Egypt at that point. So in, a, in effect, uh, having a nuclear Iran negates Israel's ability to just relentlessly bully its neighbors. And, as, and the same would be true if Egypt had the nuke, which, by the way, Egypt did begin working on the nuke in the aftermath of uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, a, a whole slew of states began working on the nuke. What then happened was the Fukushima disaster, and then Egypt backed away. Egypt decided that uh, if Japan could have this kind of a problem, there's no way Egypt could prevent such a problem from happening. Um, okay. Uh, can so we? Can I just we? Want to address an, uh, the feature about Israel having the nuke and the double thing, because we really actually haven't done that yet. Right. So uh, it is true that the United States definitely played a role in Israel getting the, the nuclear weapon. It is. It is also true that South Africa played a role in Israel getting the nuclear weapon. Interestingly enough, 
Um, officially, Israel stole the material that it got from the United States. Now, what the reason I'm mentioning this even is because you would think that would have been an international incident and would have resulted in a in a serious and serious damage to U.S.-Israeli relations, and it didn't. The United States almost didn't seem to mind. So, you know, it sort of begs the question, was it actually theft, or did the United States actively pursue giving Israel the material and then just simply pretended it was theft? And the reason I'm mentioning all of that is because at the end of the day, I think most Americans see Israel as a colony. They see it as an extension. So they, they see it as their, their, little, their little outpost in the Middle East. So anytime Israel does anything or anytime Israel gets special treatment, the United States just sort of regards it as a, as a natural outgrowth of you know, the special treatment you give your child. Um, and it's, it's so there is totally a double standard, but it's a double standard I don't think most Americans even are aware of. They, they just see this as what you would do. This is a very good uh, point for me to, to ask a question that I wanted to, to ask before as well, and I kind of mentioned something. Um, when you're talking about double standards, um, couldn't you also say that looking at this from the lens of, of, of uh, anti-Semitism anti studies, you know, and uh, I'm talking specifically about Frankfurt School, Adorno, Horkheimer, what is known as the critical theory in, in the German tradition of the word. Um, Israel's unique position in the world as the only Jewish state is to be protected at all costs against uh, fantasies of complete annihilation of Jews that were actually manifesting themselves not only in the Holocaust but also in pogroms in, in Russia in the 1880s and, and in the 2000 years preceding this. So if we are talking about this topic, I think it, it's important to never kind of forget about this important aspect to the equation. And um, this is also one of the big schisms, which I mentioned before about, about the, the, the American tradition of critical theory with scholars uh, such as Judith Butler, who is a Jew herself, but she's a vocal opponent of, of, of Zionism. And even in uh, one public lecture at uh, Berkeley, she mentioned that she thinks uh, Hezbollah and Hamas are part of the global left. Um, and I think the question of anti-Semitism and its specific dynamics, which are not equal to other forms of racism, um, have to be a part of this equation if we're talking about uh, Middle Eastern policy and uh, Israel and Iran, question of the, of the nuclear weapon. So this is brought up a lot that you know the, the, the Jewish people went through so much turmoil um, so we need to have a Jewish state and I guess presumably then that way the Jewish state would defend would defend the Jewish population. So it's worth pointing out that that 2,000 years you're talking about is almost entirely in Europe. So the, so what we're, what, when you, you talk about what the Romans did and then you jump into the, the pogroms, you, the, the first crusade, um, and then ultimately the Holocaust, that, those are European crimes against uh, the Jewish people. Those aren't Palestinian crimes against the Jewish people. In the Middle East, under Arab rule, even though Jews weren't equal to Muslims, and, and neither were Christians, they weren't equal to Muslims either, the amount of respect... Uh, what was that? Uh, right, exactly. Um, the, 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 being a dimmy just wasn't that bad. I mean, there were, there were occasional outbreaks, uh, occasionally Muslim rulers would turn on a population, uh, either Jews or, or Christians, but, but compared to Europe, what the Jews and the Christians experienced in the Middle East was a, a vacation, it was a holiday. So by creating this Jewish-only state, this exclusivist, uh, racialized, because what we've done is we've racialized Jews in the process, right? Being yeah. Jewish is no longer a religion, it's really a race. Um, creating that exclusivist state in Palestine has come at the expense of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people have now been in the 70 years where they're, the vast majority of their population is refugee. 
there is no prospect that there are ever going to not be refugees. The UN basically has a whole uh, agency just set aside so that the Palestinians can be refugees for all eternity. UN so you know, like, UAE. yeah. Uh, so you know, we what we've done is to solve they're, they're, the problem. They're inheriting the refugee status. I'm sorry. <laughs> they do. They inherit the, 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 the men. So the, the, the implementation of it is ent entirely sexist because if you're if your mother is Palestinian, you're not Palestinian. It only matters if your father was Palestinian. So you know, like the whole system is 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 predicated on that it's okay for there to be an Israeli state, even though it's at the expense of Palestinians. So what does that mean? Palestinians are are they subhuman? Do they do they do they not get human rights? I, I don't understand right. how you could possibly. Okay. But that's also, I mean, that's a, a completely different topic, and I agree that there's grave injustice going on in, in, you know, parts of what is now Gaza and the West Bank. And But in mainland Israel, I mean, Arabs have equal rights to, to, to Jews. Like, uh, they, they, they're, 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 they're Arabs in the Knesset, I mean, they're Arabs in the Supreme Court. That's the equivalent of saying that uh, in the 1960s, African Americans were equal to whites. I mean, it's it's not true in any meaningful way. I mean, sure, there was a black Supreme Court justice, and sure, there was an occasional black politician, but nobody could possibly take that as serious. If Arabs were truly equal to Israelis, then Israel would become a democracy, a secular democracy, and all the Palestinians regardless of whether they're in Israel proper or in the West Bank of the Gaza Strip, would instantly have citizenship. And then at that point, we can talk about equality. But the reason why that will yeah. never happen, at least as far as Israelis are concerned, is because they become a minority. Minority in their own state, yes. But don't right. you see how that's a, a scary thing for, for, for Jews living in Israel at this point? I mean, so, I, I'm, I'm saying... I'm not even it's scary like, because after 70 years of abusing Palestinians, I think it's reasonable to assume that they're going to be angry. I mean, I, but it's no more scary than what whites in South Africa had to go through. I mean, if you were Afrikaner or if you were English and you lived in South Africa, can you imagine if you're outnumbered seven to one and you're, the, the country is not going to become a democracy? And, you know, South Africa is by no means perfect, but I, they, they've at least partially pulled this off. Right, but I mean, there's still great disparity, and whites still own 70% of the land, and now they're getting murdered, some of them by uh, outraged blacks who want to grab their land, and so on. So it's, it's really not a good good example of, of what, what the Jewish uh, or Israelis should, should follow in terms of policy. But I, I'm also looking at it, and I know that you're... Well, I'm also looking at it from a, from a psychological point of view, because I know that you're interested in that as well, and you have uh, vast knowledge in, in this area as well. But um, I don't know whether I, as a non-Jew, could even put myself into the position of a collective fear that I don't think is just rhetoric, and I don't think it's made up or it's just an, an argument for why they want to like you know bully other neighboring countries and Arabs and so on. I really believe that the experience of the Holocaust and of genocide meted out on, on Jews by Europeans, as you said correctly, but even then, I mean, you had the, the, the Mufti of, of Jerusalem uh, coming and meeting uh, Hitler and Ribbentrop uh, in, in 1936. Well, when I, you I, do that, Leahy met with, uh, Leahy, the Jewish terrorist organization in Palestine, yeah. met representatives of Adolf Eichmann. And, and, and they basically declared war on, on the British mandate during World War II to help the Nazis. Yeah, you're, you're no, absolutely right in that. Uh, no, because what we do is we do this collective punishment thing. One person commits a crime from a group, and now the whole group is suddenly responsible. It, it's, it doesn't make sense. So there were Jews in Palestine before Ashkenazi Jews began leaving Europe and going to Palestine. So there's sort of this myth that you know, there was no Jewish presence there. What the tragedy of, of Zionism has been, the ethnic cleansing of the Jewish populations in the Middle East. There used to be thriving Jewish communities in Egypt and Morocco and Yemen and Iraq, and now those are gone. And, and so, you know, as a person who is you know, deeply sensitive to anti-Semitism, 
and deeply committed to fighting it everywhere. I actually think Zionism plays into the hands of anti-Semitism, not only because it, it pits natural allies against each other in this conflict. Arabs and Jews have historically been friends, but, but also because what it does is it, it advocates, it advocates the ethnic cleansing of Jewish populations. Um, it advocates the removal of Jews from Europe and the United States and Yemen and Morocco and Iraq and putting them all in one place. And I, I think any, any ideology that says that is by its very nature deeply racist. That, that, that was my point with, with uh, anti-Semitism as a, as a form of legitimation for the state of Israel. That exactly was my point, but I couldn't uh, uh, articulate. Yeah. yeah, that was my point. Yeah. I, I Agree, because I do think that that the experience of, of genocide and, and persecution over that prolonged period of time, which is unparalleled in history, it, the, the Jews seem to own, have been the only people in recent memory who have had this this uh, destiny. Um, in, not only in, in Europe, but in, in in many places of the world. Sometimes stronger, sometimes not so strong. But I think it does legitimize at least a desire to have a Jewish majority state that is strong and able to defend itself. And I think also it kind of helps you understand why the prospect of having a country that says that he wants to wipe you off the face of the earth, have nukes, is a very scary thought. And also the, 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 um, the reason why they don't want to come back to the green table to negotiate a peace with Hamas who also in their charter states that they want to annihilate uh, Israel and the Jews. So I think it's, it's, it's just, it's understandable, even though I don't want to say that um, I take party uh, defending Israel and all its, its, its foreign policy. I don't want you to, to misunderstand me, but I think it's because, I mean, I, 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 I'm Austrian, you know, I'm ethnically Austrian, you know, my grandparents, even though they never talked about it, they had part in, you know, they were the, some of them were in the army, uh, Wehrmacht, you know, and I I was serving my civil service in uh, Buenos Aires in a Jewish uh, old people's home where I you know talked to these people and that, that they they fled Austria, Germany, Hungary um, in in during the, the Third Reich. So I have kind of like this 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 perspective on things where I can see and I really take it seriously the. The fear of, of Jewish people that something like that will happen again. So, but I understand your uh, argument as well, Professor. So, but before before we go on, I, I want to point out that I totally get what you're saying and I totally agree with it. And I and I don't even think that that fear is outrageous. I think that fear is completely legitimate. And in fact, we're seeing it happening in the United States, and I and I think we're seeing it flare up in Europe as well. Um, the, the, the insanity of the world that we live in right now is we are seeing this dramatic rise in anti-Semitism. And, you know, Berlin has become scary. The United yeah. States has become scary. So, if anything, I think it's reinforced. What I, I guess from my standpoint as a peace activist who believes strongly that everybody on Earth is special, that nobody should have a special place, right? Because if everybody's special, then nobody's special. Um, I think what Israel has to do and it has to do it now, not, not in 10 years, not in 20 years, not in 50 years, is it needs to go and reconcile with the Palestinians and make a deal where a secular state is created that has safeguards for, for all the different raci uh, racial and religious minorities in Palestine. And you call whatever you want, pa uh, Isratim, you know, just, it doesn't really even matter just if for no other reason to safeguard Jews and to, and to make sure that there is a future. Because at the, at the current policies that Israel has are completely unsustainable. And if the United States ever, ever wavers in its support of Israel, Israel can't last by itself. So to me, this looks like a dead end that ends very badly. And I really don't want that to happen. The last thing the world needs is, is another disaster for the Jewish population. Um, especially because the United States has become so hostile. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know about this, but in uh, in 2016 and 17, there was a very significant population, I, I believe it was in the thousands, of, of Jewish Americans who actually went to Germany and got their citizenship because they wanted to have 
the ability to get out. Like, that's how real this has become in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, this actually brings me to um, another question that I have for you, Professor, um, which uh, is the situation of political activism, um, let's say progressive political activism, because we don't want to call it left-wing political activism, which is it doesn't seem to be in the United States right now. Um, we've seen one of the biggest manifestations of a protest movement in the history of the United States with the Women's March. The Women's March in 2017, Women's March in 2018, even though much smaller, was still the second biggest uh, protest movement uh, in the history of the US. Um, bigger than marches uh, uh, in, in the civil rights era and against Vietnam. And the organizing team of the Women's March, um, the Women's March National Committee, they consist of two women Uh, one is Tamika Mallory and the other one is Linda Sarsour, who, if not openly anti-Semitic, at least don't consider Jewishness to be one of the intersections of oppression currently in the United States. And uh, I don't know if you've um, heard about this, uh, Professor, but Tamika Mallory was at a an event where Louis Farrakhan the Nation of Islam uh, preacher um, ranted about, uh, you know, the Zionist world uh, domination plans and the big evil, the big Satan that, that the Jewish uh, uh, spirit is, and so on. So, how do you how do you view modern progressive political activism in the United States today? And do you think it has a blind eye for anti-Semitism? <laughs> okay. So uh, I, th I think that the majority of the left in the United States is, is either anti-Zionist or at least extremely critical of Israel. And I, and I think to conflate being anti-Zionist with being anti-Semitic is exactly the, the, the wrong thing to do. So uh, I, I am anti-Zionist. I am definitely not anti-Semitic. Like they are not in any way correlated. In fact, I, I would point out that I suspect the majority of the anti-Semitic people in the United States are actually Zionists. And it, the reason why that's compatible is because they, they want the Jews to leave the United States, whether, whether by force or voluntarily, so that they can have a Jewish free society. So if you think of a guy like Steve Bannon, for example, um, it's, it's pretty clear that his Zionism doesn't come from a deep, <laughs> deep love of black people. He's probably also pro-return to Africa, just for the record. Um, so, in the left, in the United States, there is a left, by the way, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty small and it's not very well developed, because the mm -hmm. era, remember, 60 years ago, the Democratic Party was a coalition of conservatives and liberals, and if, you know, liberals are, of course, the, the, the moderate right, and conservatives are the, the, the far right, not the extreme right, but the far right, so, in effect, mm -hmm. the Party was a coalition of the, the far right and the moderate right. The Republican Party was actually more of a, a libertarian big business political party with uh, a strong populist tendency, which was really strange because it meant that the two political parties in the United States actually aligned with people that were essentially polar opposites of them. What happened during the Reagan administration is a bunch of the conservatives in the Democratic Party left the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party ended up becoming the, 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 the moderate right party, and the Republican Party became then the far right party. Southern so, Democrats, right? Southern Democrats, absolutely. The, the, the conservative wing of the Re Democratic Party now is the conservative wing of the Republican Party. Um, so having said that, During the 60s, there were serious actual leftist organizations in the United States, and they, they fizzled out. They just basically ceased to exist. The, the attempt to create a Green Party in the United States really mostly failed, and, it, and it, not just because it didn't have the resources uh, or the political system to prevail, but because I think most Americans don't, don't know the difference between liberal and socialist. Most Americans don't understand what the actual left would look like. Yeah. Um, the conversations that I've been having recently 
uh, around race and gender, um, especially, and sort of brought this to the surface that at some mm-hmm. level, uh, activists are either focused on, on fighting sexism, but they don't care about fighting capitalism and racism, mm-hmm. or they're focused on fighting racism, but they're not interested in fighting capitalism and sexism. And, mm-hmm. and you know, at the end of the day, or, or they're focused on fighting classism and capitalism, but they're uninterested in sexism and racism. And at the end of the day, the three are totally working together. Right? In the United States, we have a triangle of, of oppression where we have this deeply racist society. Um, like, you know, we inspired South Africa. We're the ones who, who, who gave the South Africans the idea for apartheid. Like Americans walk around going, oh, that's apartheid. And it's, no, we had segregation before South Africa had apartheid. You can just go, oh, that's segregation. But right, we're so bad at self-reflection that we 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 want to use somebody else's term because we can't believe how evil we've been and we can't believe how mm-hmm. bad. We're also extremely sexist. So the the reason why the women's march had this level of uh, turnout is precisely because there is a battle to be won when it comes to gender issues. A few years ago, the Republican Party tried to pass a piece of legislation. 170 members of the House of Representatives voted to basically redefine rape so that what I think most intelligent people would would classify as a form of rape no longer counted as a form of rape. Um, Just just for the record, under the Obama administration, Obama had issued in, in 2015 guidelines that allowed universities they gave universities the ability to expel rapists, right? I mean, this is how backwards the United States is. And um, the Trump administration has rolled that back. So, you know, there there is definitely a reason to think that you need to be in the streets protesting for women's rights. Um, I, here's where people lose me. And, and this is the, the issue that I'm trying to figure out. I've actually been at a, conver- at a talk where an, a, a leftist activist, an actual leftist activist for the record, not a, not a liberal, but an actual leftist, mm-hmm. um, said, at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to fight capitalism. Capitalism is the problem. And, to, and, and racism, he is Hispanic. Racism is a tool of capitalism. At which point an African-American activist replied back saying, capitalism is a tool of racism. Oh my God, he's in the tradition of ta nehisi So I, I think what we're seeing happen here is the small left that exists in the United States is so caught up in the dynamics of sexism and racism, it's hard to see how it's actually a triangle, that it is capitalism, sexism, and racism, and that the three are working together. And, and the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is it's both that capitalism is a tool of racism, racism is a tool of sexism, that the, it's, it, it's a coordinated effort to oppress us and divide us and keep us working against ourselves. And so somehow the United States would have to overcome these divides, I think, for the left to really prosper. Um, but at the end of the day, the Democrats and the Republicans have such a monopoly, or biopoly, if that's even a word, on power, <laughs> we need to imagine Short of a 1960s style revolution, it's hard for me to imagine the left ever prevailing in the United States. Right, so, no, I think we left off uh, talking about the current political situation in the U.S., and especially in regard to left-wing slash progressive activism. And Mr. Casagranda, Professor Casagranda, said that um, anything short of a 1960s style political revolution would probably fail to consolidate this left. And I think um, it's an interesting parallel to what um, Slavoj Žižek, um, you know Slavoj Žižek, yeah. said, um, we need uh, this big turmoil that would be the Trump presidency to kind of shake up the system and wake people up to newfound uh, left-wing political activism. But I'm not seeing much of that. Yeah, I'm really disappointed with 
where we are now. If you look at you know November, December, January, like 2016, 17, all the way February, March, it looked like the United States was beginning to have something, uh, obviously because of Trump, but it, it's very much fizzled. There's still stuff going on. Uh, membership in all the leftist parties is through the roof. Uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, just in the Austin area, have 880 members, which, you know, uh, compared to where we were three years ago, I, 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 I'm making this number up, but I think we were around 100 members. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, you know, that's a pretty dramatic increase. Uh, so Trump has definitely had an effect. Here's the, the, one of the reasons why I think it would need to be 60s style. Because when we had the Arab Spring in the United States, it was called Occupy Wall Street. And, and it spread. Like, in, you know, I live in Austin, Texas, and we had Occupy Austin, and there was an Occupy Boston, and there was Occupy DC, Occupy Oakland. And, in those days, it was such a magical, unusual, never seen anything like it before event. And it looked like it was part of some amazing global movement. Um, I, I was tasked by Occupy Austin to do teach-ins and I brought uh, about a dozen professors to do teach-ins and I think we ended up doing like two, th two dozen teach-ins over the course of Occupy Austin, and you know, I really, it really looked like something interesting was was happening, and in the end, it, it fizzled and died. In Austin, people just sort of broke up and went away. In uh, Boston, uh, New York, and Oakland, the the police came in and very violently ended those occupation movements. Um, the, under the Obama administration. The, the divided Congress, the Republicans had the House and the Democrats had the Senate, managed to pass legislation, and then President Obama signed it, that allowed the police to uh, ban the press from showing up to a protest event where the police planned to break it up. And so what we, we actually ended up seeing was that the Democrats and the Republicans were willing to work together to undermine the First Amendment freedom of press to, so that so that the police could undermine the First Amendment freedom of assembly and First Amendment freedom of speech by basically violently ending protests. And uh, if you look at the, the the what video footage was derived from those events, they were basically in a press blackout. It's incredible the level of violence um, that the that the police enacted on the protesters. And I think the only way you could possibly ever overcome that kind of brutal police state response to peaceful demonstrators would be if you had such great numbers that they just simply can't do it. Mm. And, and at the end of the day, Occupy, Wall Street, Boston, and Oakland were just not large enough. Mm. Um, in, in Oakland, they were, they were, the protesters fought back. They were rolling battles. Uh, tear canisters going in every direction. It was, mm. it was incredible. It looked like something interesting was about to happen and it just stopped. But what does it mean, uh, uh, connecting to, to what you just said, what does it mean for you know, public protests if the civil police is armed with military grade riot gear that is able to subdue protesters probably in the hundreds of thousands with tear gas, with drones, with um, with riot vehicles that can physically push back hundreds of people at a time, um, is is public, you know, unrest short of you know millions marching in the streets making it a political disaster to intervene? Is it even still effectively possible? So, I mean, I I, I don't know that I know the answer to that, except to say this: in the cities where the leadership, so the mayor, as a general rule, tend to be a left-leaning. Um, so for example, in Austin, uh, immediately after Trump was elected, there, were, there was rolling protests, day after day of protest. And you know, Austin is in the middle of Texas. Texas is a very conservative state, but Austin yeah. itself is very left-leaning. Very liberal. Yeah, and so we, 
I was observing one of the protests, and the protesters wanted to take the street. And I've been protesting uh, since 1991, so I have a little bit of experience protesting in the United States. And yeah, you know, there was no way we had the numbers to take the street. You really have to have large numbers to take the street. If you can walk on the sidewalk and be polite, but if you don't have the numbers, you shouldn't go into the street. The police won't allow it. So the protest organizers took the public into the street and to my shock and dismay the police allowed it so <laughs> one of the interesting things that, that Trump has done is at least in areas that are left-leaning um, the, the police have really gotten gentle with the public uh, the Women's March in Austin was remarkable because the protesters started at the Capitol and they went down to the river and then they rotated back up and it was a continuous loop. I've never been in a U.S. protest that was a continuous loop. There was no end. You could you could just go for hours. Uh, you know. So there are these moments, these little flashes, where you think, "Wow, something could come of this." And then you know, a few weeks later, it's silent. There's nothing going on. Um, the United States has been on a trajectory really since Reagan, but you could probably actually trace some of it earlier than that towards becoming a police state. So, you know, like the, the Economist rank has been ranking democracies now for, I think, a dozen years. And the United States is consistently becoming less and less democratic. It's now uh, a deeply flawed, marginal democracy. But in, re in reality, the United States is, is actually not that anymore. The United States is really, truthfully, a hybrid, which is what they call the thing between an th authoritarian state and a democracy. And the reason I'm saying this is twofold. One, the political system is, is rigged. So, you know, we're always talking about how the Russians have rigged elections or, or, you know, that country has a rigged election. Venezuela has a rigged election. Well, the United States elections are rigged as well. Um, and the way they do it is through the process of gerrymandering, where the politicians draw the boundaries on where the districts are and then make them so that the outcomes are predetermined. Right now in the United States, of our congressional seats, only 4% are competitive. So 96% of the, the politicians running for re-election know they are going to get re-elected. It's, it's not an if, it's, it's, a, it's almost it's guaranteed. guaranteed. We, we are, we, depending on the election, we have somewhere between 2 to 4, 2 to 5% incumbency turnover rate, which by definition makes us not democratic because there's no way that the American public is in love with that many politicians that they want them to come right back. And so what, to combine that then with the fact that since 2001, the, the, the federal government has been selling the local police military grade equipment. So the, the, the local police have weapons that you would expect you would be using in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I posted on Facebook a few years ago during the Ferguson, Missouri protests. I posted a picture and I said, uh, I, I can't identify this military uniform. Which branch of the service is this? <laughs> and uh, and a, friend, a friend posted, oh, you're, you're an idiot. This isn't the military, this is the police, which was exactly what I was trying to get to, right? Um, and, and, you know, if you can't tell the difference between the police and the military, you are officially a police state. You are officially a third world two-bit tyranny. And the United States has somehow found itself there. Um, so, I, again, I mean, go back to your question. I think for all intents and purposes, the First Amendment is, is at least mortally wounded if it's not dead already. Um, you know, like I can say a lot in the classroom. I can do these 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 lectures. I can, you know, I can interview with you guys. But the fact of the matter is, the American public doesn't watch that stuff. They're not engaged. Uh, they're they're binge watching their favorite TV show like Walking Dead and shopping in shopping malls and and mm. in a coma somewhere. So it, it is always just a small percentage of the population that's engaged and and actively fighting back against um, social injustice, economic injustice, whatever, whatever the cause is um, today. One, one thesis, I think, from Noam Chomsky, and um, um, I think uh, Herman, I forgot his name. Uh, Edward S. Herman? Edward, yeah, 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 right. 
And uh, their thesis was that corporate media is like uh, profit driven, a profit driven institution. And therefore they, they had a, a, a agenda and that, that agenda was, uh, you know, mm, like th th this corporate media uh, tend to serve uh, the agenda of the interests of the dominant elite, so to speak. And I think uh, it was pretty uh, a pretty good book that, that showed the evidence that the media is, is profit driven and therefore it's not democratic. So in this sense, the US is also not democratic. Absolutely, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, if the only thing you care about is getting your ratings up, you might not even care to defend capitalism. Um, you're just going to avoid producing the kind of news that upsets your viewers. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and the American public is really wedded to the idea that the United States is the good guy, that capitalism is, is God-given, that we should do it, that we're a healthy, strong, powerful democracy, that everybody has equal opportunity. You know, right? There are these really crazy myths that Americans are very wedded to. So the idea of having a mainstream news organization pushing back against that and going, wait a minute, this isn't true, that and, jeopardizes their viewership. And another point, another you point... Could, you could also talk with, with Gramsci in saying that uh, hegemony is coercion combined with consensus. True. It's a, it's, a, it's a combination of people aware of the machine and, and actively, you know, uh, perpetuating it, and people who, who are who don't even have a political agenda, much less of a political opinion, but are still perpetuating this kind of fine-tuned machinery that is the capitalist state. I, I, I agree. I have some amazing, wonderful news for you. And that is, the United States has not been at war since World War II. Ah, okay, they, they never declared the war. Okay, so, okay, okay, I was so wrong. We've probably been in 80 military conflicts since World War II, right? You know, we think of the big ones, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. But we're, we're everywhere all the time, shooting someplace up. And we just don't declare war anymore. Um, so... The first president to do this, by the way, to take us to war without a declaration of war was actually John Adams. So our second president was already violating the Constitution. Um, and, you know, he ended up being defeated by Thomas Jefferson. So um, it, it, it is interesting that the American public, at least back then, didn't like that. And they pushed back against it. Having said that, in uh, right after Labor Day in 2002, um, Congress did authorize George Bush Jr. to use force in the war of terror. I'm sorry, the war of terrorism, the war against terrorism. It's it's all mixed up in my head now. Um, and so technically, as far as law is concerned, even though no declaration of war was issued by Congress, I don't think Jr. was in violation of the United States law. I, I think you could make the argument that because we don't declare war anymore, there's sort of a convention that as long as Congress is authorizing the use of military force, it's acceptable. What's interesting is Obama then used that authorization of force in Iraq to bomb Syria, which I think was a really big stretch. Um, and the reason he said that was because to fight ISIL, he needed to be able to bomb ISIL units in Syria. But then, next thing you know, Obama is putting soldiers on the ground, so he's escalating the war in Syria. And then Trump comes in and is now bombing Syrian targets. So if anybody has outright violated the Constitution, it's, it's Trump, the president, Donald Trump. Maybe not the first time he bombed Syria, definitely the second time he bombed Syria. There's a, you could, the War Powers Act may have allowed, and I'm not a constitutional law guy, uh, so, you know, like, I, I, I'm on shaky ground here, but the War Powers Act may have allowed the president to bomb Syria in 2017, but definitely not in 2018. So, you're right, um, when it, even when it comes to war, we've sort of lost our democracy, but some fun stats from 2003 in the build-up to the war against Iraq. If you ask the average American, do you support the war in Iraq? About 60% of the public said yes. 
when you ask specifics, so you sort of, well, you know, why are we going to war? And you sort of break it down, the number dropped. It probably ended up being about 40, 45% of the public support of the war. But if you looked at the people in the press, so who is CNN interviewing? Who is Fox interviewing? Who is NBC interviewing? It looked like 95% of the people being interviewed were for the war in Iraq. So the, the, the press and the political activists, or the, and, the, and the politicians, the politician class, and you know the diplomatic corps, all these people that are supposed to be running the government and then the people who are supposed to be reporting on the government, they all appear to be hawks wanting this war. And, and, they, and they deliberately played this game. My favorite example of this, and it really speaks to the sort of Chomsky, Herman uh, analysis of the American press, was Dick Cheney had his office leak a story to the New York Times saying that they had categorical evidence that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And then the next day, the press went and interviewed Dick Cheney, and they said, Mr. Vice President, what was your, how do you know that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? And his response was, I read it in the New York Times yesterday. No way. <laughs> wow. No. You made this up, right? I wish I had. Wow, it sounds like a joke. In 2006, the New York Times apologized for the role that they had played. But you know, what good is an apology three years yeah. later for, the, for yeah. this nasty thing you did? That's incredible. But yeah. I mean, uh, this, is, this is a little bit outside of like a, an analytic question, but uh, it's, it's really hard to, 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 to keep your faith in the, pol you know, in the political opinion or, or in the American public as a political actor, at least potentially. When you have a political situation that's such a chaos, and you have a president that coerces porn stars and their children via his attorney, uh, like bullying them into you know staying quiet, and and it's not even a public outrage. And even prior to his election, you know, saying it, as a super, if you're a star, you can you can do anything. You can grab him by the pussy. Right? I mean, it's, it's just the, 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 the corruption and the lack of decency. I mean, if you, if even like going back to, to prior political debates, if you listen to Reagan and what he said uh, about immigrants, for example, right? Um, that he said there has to be amnesia, you know, we, we can't persecute uh, them for coming into the country, we can't, you know, ship them and so on. And if you compare or, or contrast that to, to what Trump has said, uh, <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like Reagan is, you can criticize him for a lot of things, but at least he had the decency, you know, to, to not act like a complete buffoon on, 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 on like, yeah. it's, it's, it's really hard to, 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 to have hope for, for a future <laughs> in, in the United States if, if, if a person like that can get elected. And if his ratings are now up, as I understand, right? They are up. First one and a half years, he's now at like forty five percent, even scraping a fifty. No, no, he's forty point five percent. Oh, forty point five. Okay. Well, so his ratings fell to thirty six percent, which by no means is the worst we've ever had. We've we've had presidents in the twenties before. Um, Nixon, but, right? What was that? Nixon. Uh, so I think the, the the four presidents that hit the twenties were George Bush Jr., Nixon. Truman and I think Carter grazed grazed the twenties if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, you know it's sort of a, a strange grouping, but uh, his popularity is definitely tied to his racism. So uh, you know if you'll remember sh the the Virginia protests in Charlottesville, where there were you know these neo Nazis <laughs> marching through the streets. And he said there are good people on both sides. Yeah. They, they were chanting, you will not replace us, meaning people of color, obviously. But as, after a while, they began chanting, Jews will not, Jews replace, will not us. replace us. They, 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 you know, so it was like this really intense anti-Semitic, anti, uh, 
anti-non-white event, and here's this guy saying there are good people on both sides. Um, and then there was a Jewish cemetery that was attacked, and uh, he refused he refused to denounce the attack on the Jewish cemetery. And in fact, interestingly enough, it was a, a mosque that began fundraising to, to repair the damage done on the Jewish cemetery. So one of the nice things about Trump is he's really done a great job of bringing Muslims and Jews together in the United States. And he's done a really good job of creating a dialogue between Muslims and Jews and African Americans and Hispanics. But, you know, like there is, he's, he's bringing these sides that didn't see much in common with each other, but it's other than the fact that they were being persecuted. And he's, he's really done a great job of bringing them together. Um, you have to wonder about the judgment of the American public. So I've been watching his poll numbers and on Christmas, he was at, uh, if you look at Congress, the Democrats were ahead of the Republicans in just a generic Congress poll by 13 percentage points. Uh, 13 percentage point victory would have given a huge majority in the House and probably given the Democrats a majority in the Senate. It's not guaranteed because it's, it's really hard for the Democrats to win the Senate this time, but it could happen. And, you know, 13 percentage points would have been a landslide victory for the Democrats. When Trump and the Republicans passed that, that ridiculous tax cut that was just basically a tax giveaway for the rich, um, the Democrats lost 0 0.8 percentage points. They went from 13 to 12.2. And then, a few weeks later, Trump said, shit haul countries, right? Yeah. The Democrats plunged. They fell to 5.5. He more than wiped out, he wiped out more than half of the Democratic lead in Congress by saying shithole countries. If you want to tap, if you want to do well in American politics, come out in your opening speech announcing you're going to run for politics saying that Mexicans are rapists and, and murderers and you're, you'll win the presidency. I mean, I, I, I think that's the lesson I learned. If, you, if your poll numbers aren't doing well, Say that Africa is a, a bunch of shithole countries. Your poll numbers will will go in the right direction. Um, yeah, I've I've totally lost faith in in, in people in the U.S. I, 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 interesting enough, except for that group of pop, of people who feel persecuted right now. I think they've that there's there's new life in that population. I mean, uh, we can draw a similar picture in in Europe with the populist uh, rise up in Poland in Hungary, in Austria, I mean, in France with Le Pen, it's, it's like everywhere in, in, Western, in Western Europe. It, it, it's really depressing because it looks like the world is going in the direction we were going in the 1930s. All of a sudden there's this reactionary movement to the right. And in the 30s, there was the Great Depression to blame it on. What do we have to blame it on now? Uh, the 2008 the two, the That's economic true. crisis, the worldwide economic crisis. Then we had, yeah. um, I think, this this uh, Eastern Asian uh, Eurasian project, um, BRICS, uh, China, and the one wall, run, one road, one belt project. So we have a, a counter hegemonic project on the other side, which is like, which is like, yeah, I think. It's like, uh, from a geostrategical point of view, it's like, um, yeah, we, we, you know, the Western have to build uh, ideology to, to, you know, like, like with the NS, you know, like to fight the other, you know, to build the other. So what Europe is doing, we are building the other. And yeah, it's, it's dangerous. I think it's, it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's happening and you can't stop it because what, what we can see here in, 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 in my experience in Austria, um, the, the anti-Muslim, the, the, the Islamophobic tendencies uh, that I can personally see. And of course, um, it, there is a lot of empirical studies um, in Germany. I forgot the name of the professor. Um, yeah, uh, never mind. But um, yeah, there there are empirical studies that Islamophobic tendencies are getting higher and higher. It, it's like, yeah, there are similarities to the to the nineteen thirties. 
in many in many in many regards. These these uh, Islamophobic Austria and, and Germany with the uh, uh, AFD um, gaining in, in, in popularity, the Islamophobic sentiment um, or the anti-Muslim racism, which I think is, is a little bit of a better term. I, um, I agree with that, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't think we should be using Islamophobia. Yeah. I think we should be anti-Muslim racism. True. Yeah. So I think um, it actually it feeds into creating an even bigger rift be between the Muslim population, which is predominantly of Turkish origin in Germany and Austria, and the general autochthonous uh, population. And it's actually a very dangerous dynamic, uh, I think, um, if you look at the involvement um, of right-wing uh, Islamist slash neo-fascist um, influence of the Turkey holds in um, Austria and uh, and, sure. um, and Germany. There's actually it, it's really crazy. It's it's it, somehow a little bit under the surface. Sometimes there are some uh, articles in, in newspapers and so on, but the influence is re continuously growing. And um, there's some poll uh, results. Maybe we can link them afterwards in the yeah. discussion because I don't mm -hmm. have them in my head right now. Um, where a majority of second and third generation. Uh, Turks, if I'm not uh, misconstruing this in my head, I'm actually identifying now more with Turkey as their like nationality and their their sense of belonging is more towards Turkey than towards the country that they were actually born in. And you see that there's a rise in in in, in right wing uh, membership in APF, for example, which is the Austrian Turk uh, Federation, which is actually a branch of the um, MHP, the the, the Turk have become more Islamist and the Islamists have become more nationalistic and the, the influence is really staggering that they have and I think this this anti-Muslim racism actually helps to 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 further uh, create or to further this rift between like what we what what is like this construction of us versus that this identity alter alternative um, Rift. And I think it's a very scary development, and I think we see it not just in, in Austria and Germany, but as, as you said, um, Josef, in, in, in Hungary which I, and in Poland, which I think is our very scary development indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 sorry. No, no, please. I, I was going to say, I, I think this is actually something that uh, the United States needs to take a lot of credit for. Um, and, it's, and it's because the United States is really push this terrorism, uh, th this terrorism hysteria on the world, and it's just on and on and on. It, it's all, it's, it's the point of, of madness, like the United States goes to war with Afghanistan and Iraq, and yet, when was, when was there ever an Afghan or an Iraqi who was convicted of or found to have committed an act of terrorism against the United States, right? I mean, these are here these two states that don't produce terrorists, and the United States is bombing them into the Stone Ages. And, you know, in the process, we created ISIL. ISIL is our, our baby. We, we, it formed in 2004 as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, specifically to fight the United States. And it was after the United States disassembled the Iraqi state. Nobody in their right mind invades a country and then takes apart the state apparatus. You maybe decapitate it, right? When you conquer a country, you, you, you kill the top leadership or chase them off or imprison them. But you, to take the state apart means you have to start the state apparatus from zero. There's no culture, there's no tradition, there's, there's no legitimacy. And that's exactly what the United States did. It completely erased the state, except for the Ministry of Oil. It kept, it kept one institution. Um, and all of a sudden, all of these bureaucrats and, and policemen and politicians and military form al Qaeda in Iraq to fight the United States. They, that's what became ISIL. And, and, and so the, the lesson I keep learning over and over again, I don't know why the, pol the policy makers don't learn, is every time you are cruel and violent to a population, you're going to get a reaction from that population. They're going to become cruel and violent back. Now, they, if they can't do it to you, they'll do it to somebody else, right? So, like, Zionism is that. You're systematically violent and cruel to the Jewish population, and then now they're systematically cruel and violent to the Palestinian population. Um, 
or or you know the United States bombs Iraq and now you have jihadists running around the world trying to commit acts of terror in in Western Europe and the United States. I mean, we should you should expect that violence begets violence. That there is sort of this iterative effect of how much rhetoric and how many bombs you can drop on a population before they turn. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is a very depressing uh, note to end on. So, can we maybe like <laughs> try to turn it around and and and. What do you think are could be some some things that we could do as young political activists that are trying to you know do their part in you know maybe creating a better world for for lack of a less uh, uh, you know idealized phrase but like what, what what can we do to consolidate a movement that can unite young people in their pursuit of a better and more just and more equal society. I, I mean, this is something I struggle with regularly because I'm trying not to get so depressed that I quit. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the reason why I remain active and the reason why I remain an activist, because I, I have a serious incentive to shut up. Um, you know. Every time I open my mouth, the thought that goes through my head is, am I going to lose my job, right? Am I, uh, uh, is the state going to finally come after me? Uh, uh, just for the record, the, uh, the United States did come after me in 2006. Uh, Homeland Security uh, actually came after me and they, they wanted to interview me and they said it was because I had said something of political concern. And uh, my, my attorney said he's a political scientist, presumably everything he says is a political concern. <laughs> Uh, and, and the way the way we resisted that democracy at its purest. What was that? No, oh, I was just joking. Sorry, I was just saying democracy at its purest, at its best. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the way we fought that was my attorneys and I. We decided to refuse to interview, so I, I ended up never interviewing with Homeland Security. Having said that. Uh, in, in 2016, and then again in 2017, I, I had an event each year that was censored. And it was censored specifically because, the first one was censored because um, it, was, it was critical of Israel, and the second one was censored because it was critical of US foreign policy. And, uh, you know, like, so I have to constantly think about this. I've lived in third world country. I know what it's like to constantly wonder about, oh, did I cross that line? Am I going to get in trouble now? Um, so I guess the reason why I don't shut up, and I guess the reason why I keep plugging away at it is I, I just wouldn't be able to sleep otherwise. Um, I think you have to do it because it's what you, what comes from your heart. Like I, I don't think there's a way to force people into awareness. I think what you have to do is keep picking away at it, keep talking, keep engaging. Uh, I use the I use opportunities like this. I you know I try to break down the negative paradigms in the classroom. So I have a job that's really effective for trying to get to people. Um, you know, there the biggest problem is I have to get rid of all the myths. You know, no Abraham Lincoln was not born in a log cabin. He built with his own hands. You know, like <laughs> the, the American government's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we have gerrymandering, that's one of the things I have to teach in the classroom because I have to show them, your vote really doesn't matter. We have to get rid of gerrymandering for us to ever get your vote to matter. Citizens United. Oh my God, nightmare. Uh, interestingly enough, the Supreme Court, a very similar configuration to the one we have now that gave us Citizens United is now actually debating whether or not to declare gerrymandering unconstitutional. Um, it'll be interesting to see how, how it falls, but it's almost certain that it'll be a five to four decision whether it goes for or against. Um, anyway, I, I think there is a lot of hope. And, and the reason why I say that, despite all the negative we've been talking about, is, is precisely because I think Trump and, uh, and Brexit, because Brexit looks like it's gonna be a very painful experience for Britain. I think that these moments of pain 
it'll polarize, which isn't necessarily good, but that polarization will definitely increase the size of the left. And I think if the left can, can stay logical, stay clear, not, not get too wrapped up in emotions and just keep picking away at it, we can at least create a form of resistance against the right, and we can at least maybe push back against imperialism at some level. Um, I, I, I'm baffled at the fact that, you know, after killing three million Iraqis, the average American can sleep at night. Like, I can't, I can't process that. Uh, it, was, it took 21 years to do that, so I'm including the first war and the sanctions Clinton imposed. But when you, when you put that three million together over 21 years, it's the equivalent of a 9-11 every 10 days. And the fact okay. that the American public doesn't, doesn't see that is baffling to me. So I think at that point, what we have to do is keep screaming that. Like we need to keep, keep putting it out there, keep putting it out there. But, but I'm sorry, but three million, um, that's the first time I'm hearing that number. I mean, isn't, 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 aren't the, the majority of like uh, casualties, I mean, at least after 2001, not directly killed by the U.S. military, but like victims of sectarian violence, which is, I'm not saying that, you know, like uh, the U.S. has nothing to do with that, but to say that we killed or you killed them, is, isn't that a little bit exaggerated? Well, I mean, that's, so I, I go into a country, I get rid of its state, so there's no state apparatus, and then a bunch of violence happens, all that violence is on me. I might as well have squeezed the trigger. But it is also worth pointing out that 800,000 of those deaths was done under Clinton sanctions, Clinton era sanctions, where the Iraqi population was deprived of food and medicine. Um, and then uh, when we disassembled and destroyed the Iraqi state, there was probably another 1.2 to 2 million deaths there, and then a couple of hundred thousand in the first war. By the time you're done, it's probably right around 3 million. I, I can actually show you or give you a couple of stats to sort of confirm that number. Um, Are you talking about the Lancet study? No, I was actually going to bring up the number of orphans in Iraq. Uh, there's a, there, at the time that the war ended, so 2011, there were 5 million orphans in Iraq. Well, it was a country of 30 million people. 5 million is amazing, right? That's one out of every six people was an orphan. Like, that is a level of violent brutality that's hard to comprehend. Um, it just so happens that the Iraqi female fertility rate is five. So a million dead, a five million orphans means a million dead mothers and a million dead fathers. That's two million right there. You almost don't even have to go any further to realize that the enormity of the violence that we inflicted on Iraq was through the roof. And then you do that on the heels of Vietnam, and then you consider the fact that we overthrew the government, the democratic government in Chile in, in 1973, That's and we overthrew right? By the time you go through all that, the United States comes we must out. We not forget, I just want to mention Indonesia, which is my personal... I agree. Like, the, the, the most dreadful thing to me personally is Indonesia, man. Sukarno the the politicized side of the, of the communists and the yeah. wing people and ethnic Chinese, it's something that nobody knows about because it's just, I don't know, it's just, it, it falls through the, I don't know, through the roster of, 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 of what people even are aware of because there's so many atrocities committed, but but I think it's really worth like mentioning it on, on the record. Uh, the United States supported uh, President Sukarno in his pursuit of, of, of I think the, the estimations vary from 300,000 to actually over one or two million people killed there in just one year, 65, 66, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just completely unimaginable. Damn. But yeah. Um, uh, we wanted to end on the positive note, didn't we? <laughs> okay, so the positive note is that, that there is the potential, and it's a really powerful potential for the left to actually mobilize now. Um, in the United States, I'm seeing it by increased activism, but I'm also seeing increased membership in leftist organizations like the Democratic Socialists. I, I, I still can't wrap my mind around how many people have joined the Democratic Socialists. There are Americans now who say they're, they're socialists, and it's not taboo. It's unthinkable, right? It's unthinkable. unthinkable. The, and, the, and it's the generational. The did a great job of like completely smothering every tendency of like even just outing yourself as a socialist. Yes. 
I agree. And, it, and it's very much generational. So, you know, my students are millennials and Z generation. And I cannot tell you how many of those students identify as socialists. It's really remarkable. So, yes, we're in a dangerous time period. It's chaos. World War III is on the horizon. The right is, is, is rising. Immigrants are losing their rights. Immigrants are being radicalized in negative ways. But at the same time, we're also seeing this cadre of leftists who are forming or coming up through the ranks. You know, maybe, maybe something good can come out of all of this. I, I'm hopeful. I actually think Trump is the best thing to happen to the United States. Mm. In a paradox I, way. I think you agree with what you Yeah. I, I do. I mean, I think this has been... A, I think Clinton would have been a catastrophe. I, I, I agree. At the time, the idea of Trump being elected was horrific. But now that we're seeing sort of the effects, I, uh, I can't imagine it having gone any other way. And just one last question from my side. What do you think about the role of the internet? And I, I really, I'm serious about this because I don't think it's just like a, you know, stepchild or whatever. I think it's more and more important in our everyday lives and more and more important in the politicization of young people is, you know, the, the contact that you get in with, you know, YouTube channels, podcasts, um, memes as well you know that i don't know if you know the facebook page uh, sassy socialist memes no <laughs> you, you should no, you look it up. check it out seriously yeah. like these 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 things are now i think something that if young people get in contact with them uh it it may be something that they identify with that they find funny and and so on and so forth i think activism on the internet is, is becoming more and more crucial and we also see that the alt-right Right with their 15 minutes of fame when Trump was elected and so on, um, and uh, you know the, this this insult guy that ran over people with a truck and so on. They're all internet-based phenomena, right? Where uh, people that are like-minded, that are disenfranchised somehow in their communities or whatever, they find a, a space there where they can like share their thoughts and so on, and it it it, it becomes a cesspool of abominable, I wouldn't even call it political thought, it's just conspiracy theories and just really a cesspool of bad ideas. And I think the left, we have to counteract, and I think um, I want to actually say especially thank you for for engaging in, in this as well, um, Professor, uh, through your uh, channel and, and, and the Austin School. I think it's it's really crucial to, to actually do activism this way in, in, in this day and age. So, so I totally agree. I, I, I think we have to fight in the internet, and, I, and that's one of the reasons why we have the Austin School, um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this interview with you guys. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is great. I, I love the conversation we've had. I, I'll do this again if you ever have me on. Mm. Totally. Let's, let's do a redo of this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Okay, let's do it. Uh, having said that, I also think that the internet is extremely dangerous. And, you know, I, I mean, obviously the stuff that's happened with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook has really just sort of revealed how dangerous this is. My, my fear is that too many people with really bad educations, in the United States we systematically give people terrible educations, um, it's, it's incredible how uninformed the average American really is. It's, it's, it's painfully embarrassing, which is why so many people, when they travel overseas, you guys think there are a lot of Canadians traveling overseas. They're all people from the U.S. who are too ashamed to admit it. <laughs> um, what, 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 I, what's scary about that is, is I think people have a tendency to want a fast, quick, simple solution. Right? They want, they want things to be sort of black and white and just really easy to get to. And I think the internet is a great place to do that because you can create that kind of dialogue like, oh, we could solve this problem by X, you know? And um, all we need to do is arm teachers and school shootings will go away. <laughs> and so, I, I, so while I think there is a, the internet is a great tool and we should totally be using it, I think we also need to go in with the understanding that it's also 
the, the, the opposite is also true. The right can totally use the internet to oversimplify things, to, to exacerbate anti-Semitism, to, to increase racism around the world. Um, so I, I think we have, to, we have to play this really careful game. And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, you have to worry about guys like Abbas, who's clearly on, on the wrong side of anti-Semitism. And, you know, how do you push back against that? Like, he's got a whole population of people that he's, he's the leader of who are going to listen to him. He apologized, actually, I think. You know, but he shouldn't have said it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Absolutely. It was, it was, was in his heart, right? I mean, when Trump, when Trump apologizes for the dumb things he said, <laughs> you know, that's what when, he said. Wait, he doesn't. He doesn't. He simply yeah, doesn't. I don't think he he's ever apologized. And he backtracked the backtrack. So, like the Charlottesville thing, he said uh, there were, you know, good people on both sides, and then he said, "Well, okay, I condemn." And then he came back and said, "No, there really were good people on both sides." Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Crazy stuff. Wait, wait a second. You said, like, you were against arming teachers? That's blasphemous, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pro Second Amendment. <laughs> uh, oh, how are you going to overthrow the government? I'm okay if you arm me if I'm allowed to choose which children live. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I had some dark humor. Yeah, be careful. Be careful. Tomorrow the Homeland Security will knock on your door. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> I would be heartbroken. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna come and bail you out personally if that happens. Okay. I really appreciate and having you guys help, helping me out like that. Yeah. <laughs> we really appreciate you like taking this time uh, to talk to us, uh, Professor. It's it's been it's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed every minute of it, and. Um, yeah, I seriously hope like our viewers will, will also take something away from this discussion and maybe see you in the future.